In our session on the lungs and pleural cavities, we made reference to the large collection of lymph nodes found in the thoracic cavity draining the lungs. Not surprisingly, cancers of the lung and surrounding tissues can metastasize to these nodes, and the tumors can have some surprising effects based on the structures they compress. In discussion of the mediastinum, the heart tends to dominate the conversation, for obvious reasons. In this last session, however, we'll identify the other structures found within the mediastinum and the clinical implications they present. Welcome back. Hope you're still with me. I know it's been a lot to take in. We'll finish things off with a relatively short discussion of the other structures found within the mediastinum aside from the heart. We'll start with a look at the different regions of the mediastinum itself, then move into the three-dimensional orientation of the structures found within it. We'll review the azagous venous system and the course of the major nerves that pass through the mediastinum. Finally, we'll look at radiographic interpretations of the mediastinum and explain points of auscultation for listening to the different heart sounds. We start this discussion with a look at the specific boundaries and regions of the mediastinum. As mentioned in our discussion of the lungs, the mediastinum is the region of the thorax found between the left and right pleural cavities. It is bound superiorly by the thoracic inlet and inferiorly by the middle portion of the diaphragm. The mediastinum can be divided into four separate regions, each containing a set of specific structures. The superior mediastinum is the upper portion lying between the thoracic inlet and the theoretical transverse thoracic plane passing between the sternal angle and the T4-5 intervertebral space. The remaining three regions are all found inferior to this plane. The heart occupies the middle region of the mediastinum. We've already covered that topic in extensive detail, so let's move on. The anterior region lies in front of the heart. Only one structure of note is found here. The last segment can either be called the posterior or the inferior segment, depending on the source you are referring to. It lies between the heart and vertebral column and projects inferiorly behind the diaphragm. Many of the structures found here are continuous with the superior mediastinum so we'll discuss these regions together. The only organ of interest in the anterior mediastinum is the thymus. In young children, this plays a role in the development of T-cells, but by the time an individual reaches their early 20s, the gland will have atrophied and will be converted to fatty tissue. In elderly individuals, there is very little of the gland remaining and is difficult to differentiate from fatty tissue surrounding the heart. This will take us to the superior and inferior aspects of the mediastinum. By far, the most prominent structures in these regions are the great vessels. The aorta represents the continuation of the left ventricle. Most textbooks will show the aorta as projecting to the left, but if you look at it with a three-dimensional perspective, it actually arches both posterior and to the left to enter the inferior mediastinum. The arch itself gives rise to three vessels. The brachiocephalic trunk is the first of these branches and quickly gives rise to the right common carotid and right subclavian arteries. Now, notice I did not refer to this as the right brachiocephalic trunk. This is because on the left side of the body, the left common carotid and left subclavian arteries arise independently of each other as the second and third branches from the aorta. We've already discussed the subclavian artery with the upper limb and we'll look at the common carotid artery when we look at the head and neck anatomy. As the aorta descends on the left side of the body, it will give off paired intercostal arteries for each of the intercostal spaces. Note that because the aorta lies to the left of the midline, the right intercostal arteries are longer in length. We also find the superior vena cava in the superior mediastinum. This is formed from the convergence of the left and right brachiocephalic veins. Okay, so see what I did there, right? This time I did use the term left and right because for the veins, they are paired. By definition, they are formed at the convergent point between the subclavian vein and internal jugular veins. Although this is also very close to where the external jugular and vertebral veins all join, so it's a bit of a gray area until we get past this convergence point. This is the principal drainage system for the upper body to the right atrium of the heart. 
We don't make any real mention of the inferior vena cava in the mediastinum, as it pretty much converges with the right atrium immediately after piercing through the diaphragm. Just behind the great vessels, we find the trachea, the portion of the respiratory system that connects the larynx with the primary bronchi. Personally, I've always thought the trachea resembled a vacuum hose. This is because of the sequential cartilaginous rings that provide it with structural integrity. Again, similar to a vacuum hose, with the high levels of negative pressure found within both these structures, there would be a tendency for a smooth tube to collapse inwards. The cartilaginous rings, like the rib appearance of a vacuum hose, prevent this from happening. The trachea branches at the level of T4 into the left and right primary bronchi. Note the asymmetry between the two pipes. The left branches at a stronger angle due to the orientation of the heart ventricles. If you go into family medicine or pediatrics, at some point in time, you will be presented with a case of an aspirated object in a young child. I once found 10 kernels of unpopped popcorn up my middle child's nose. Don't ask. If it reaches the level of the bronchi and you're inspecting the area with a bronchoscope, your best bet is to look to the right primary bronchi first. This is where the majority of aspirated objects end up due to the more vertical orientation of the tube. It's just easier for them to end up in there. While we're on the topic of bronchoscopes, the split in the bronchi from the internal view resembles the keel or front of a ship. As a result, the bifurcation is referred to as the carina, which is the Latin term for ship keel. The mucosa surrounding this area is dense in free nerve endings that trigger a cough reflex to dislodge mucus and inspired objects and fluid. It's also in part responsible for the nagging cough you get with a respiratory tract infection if this area gets infected and inflamed. Moving to the posterior aspect of the trachea, we notice that the cartilage terminates, resulting in more of a C-shape in cross-section than an oval or a circle. This is to accommodate the expansion of the esophagus, which lies immediately posterior to it. The esophagus is a muscular tube about 30 centimeters in length that extends from the laryngopharynx to the thoracic diaphragm, which it pierces to enter the abdominal cavity. The upper portion of the tube is mostly composed of skeletal muscle involved in voluntary swallowing. Inferiorly, the tube transitions to smooth muscle, which produce involuntary peristalsic contractions to propel food towards the stomach. We'll discuss the muscular layers in greater detail when we discuss the digestive system. Peeling the esophagus away, we once again see the descending aorta, as well as the axagous venous system that we discussed in the session on the anterolateral thoracoabdominal wall. Sandwiched between these two structures is the thoracic lymph duct. It can be hard to identify, resembling a thin piece of string between much more prominent structures, but looks can be deceiving. This is the principal lymphatic drainage for the left thorax and upper limb, as well as the entire abdomen and both lower limbs. Obstruction of the duct due to tumor compression or internal scarring or infection can result in significant edema of the lower limbs due to compromisation in lymphatic drainage. The duct passes through the thoracic inlet, ultimately draining into the subclavian vein close to the entry point of the external jugular vein. A few nerves can also be identified running through the mediastinum. The most anterior of these is the phrenic nerve, made up of a combination of ventral rami stemming off the third, fourth, and fifth cervical spinal nerves. It can be found running bilaterally, passing anterior to the left and right primary bronchi. It lies in close contact to the pericardial sac and is often adherent to the fibrous pericardium. It projects to the superior surface of the diaphragm and provides motor innervation to the entire muscle. To remember this innervation pattern, the term C3, 4, and 5, keep your diaphragm alive, is commonly used. The diaphragm also receives sensory information from the central portion of the diaphragm, while the peripheral portion sends sensory information through the intercostal nerves. The next nerve to discuss is the vagus nerve. The term vagus means wanderer, which is a pretty good descriptor for the extensive branching we see with this nerve. The vagus nerve is actually one of the cranial nerves, which exits the skull through the jugular foramen and passes through the neck in the carotid sheath with the common carotid artery. 
As it passes into the thorax, the main trunks will blend in with the surface of the esophagus in order to pass into the abdomen. The left becomes the anterior esophageal plexus, and the right becomes the posterior esophageal plexus. This provides parasympathetic innervation to the majority of the digestive tract to promote the rest and digest autonomic function. In addition, there is extensive branching within the thorax as well. In the last session, we talked about the autorhythmicity of the heart. Well, this rhythmicity can be altered by parasympathetic input. Normal rhythmicity is actually around 80 beats per minute, while resting heart rate is typically lower than this. This is because of vagal tone that the heart is normally under at rest. Additional branches pass with the primary bronchi to supply the smooth muscle and regulate airway diameters in the lungs. Finally, we have two branches of note that curve under vessels within the thorax and actually travel superiorly to re-enter the neck. The branch on the left is quite noticeable, traveling under the arch of the aorta, whereas the right is not typically seen until after we dissect the neck because it curves under the right subclavian artery. Bit of a strange course, really. These branches supply the majority of muscles that make up the larynx and are called the recurrent laryngeal nerves. Paralysis to either of these branches would paralyze the vocal box and affect an individual's ability to produce sound. So that covers the parasympathetic supply to the thorax. But what about the sympathetic or flight or fight response? The sympathetics are supplied by segmental outflow from spinal cord segments T1 through L2. Before these nerve fibers can reach their target organs, however, they first must pass through a nerve structure called the sympathetic chain. We can actually identify a portion of this chain in the posterior mediastinum. It gets its name from the repeating arrangement of ganglia containing postsynaptic cell bodies interconnected by small neural tracts. The specific anatomy of the sympathetic chain is outside the focus of current discussion. The topic is covered extensively in previously published videos on the autonomic nervous system. The last topic for today is medical imaging of the thorax, a lot of which involves transaxial CT or MRI images. On the left, we have a schematic representation of the thorax. Now let's take a second to consider the orientation of the image. We are looking at a bottom-up representation of the body. In other words, if this was a cadaver sawed in half, you would be looking at the top section of the body as if you were standing by where the cadaver's feet should be. This is the standard view that is assumed with all transaxial medical images. It's important to keep this distinction in mind. If you're looking at it as if it were a top-down view, which kind of is natural to do, then you would expect the left side of the body to appear on the left side of the image. Not the case here. Note that the heart is deviating towards the right side of the image, which represents the left side of the body. Similarly, we see the thoracic aorta found to the left of the body on the right side of the image as well. It takes a little getting used to, but once you do, it's fairly easy to keep your orientation. The important point to make here is the orientation of the heart chambers. Although we talk about the right and left sides of the heart, the heart does not sit perfectly flat in the body. Instead, the heart is twisted, which affects the orientation of the chambers. Notice we have the right atrium on the right side of the body and the left ventricle on the left side. Okay, no surprises there, but notice the location of the left atrium. It's actually located posteriorly, just in front of the esophagus. Also note the location of the right ventricle, more anteriorly directed. So when looking at a chest film, it's important to remember that the heart border on the patient's right represents the right atrium, whereas the border on the left side is the wall for the left ventricle. One final note to make on heart orientation as it relates to surface anatomy. The apex of the heart lies in the left fifth intercostal space with the great vessels emerging superiorly at the level of the sternal angle. As we just discussed, the right ventricle would be found just behind the sternum. Surface anatomy is also of critical importance in stethoscope placement. Remember our discussion of the lub-dub noise. Changes in the quality of the heart sound can indicate valvular diseases. For example, a lub duff sound can indicate semilunar valve disease. The problem is, if each is contributing to the second heart sound, which valve is affected? 
Clinicians have discovered that each of the four valves can be partially isolated and best heard when the stethoscope is placed in four different locations identified on the diagram. The aortic valve is best observed when the stethoscope is placed on the right second intercostal space just lateral to the sternum. Once again, this highlights the importance of the sternal angle as a clinical landmark. The left second intercostal space is the ideal location for listening to the pulmonary valve. The left fifth intercostal space is best for isolating both cuspid valves, the tricuspid parasternally, and the bicuspid or mitral valve along the midclavicular line. Listening to the heart sounds at each of these locations in sequential order is a part of any routine medical checkup and serves as a quick and inexpensive screening process for the onset of certain valvular diseases. That will finally do it for this session on the mediastinum and heart. In the next session, we'll be pulling back the diaphragm and taking a look at the contents of the abdomen. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy what's left with the rest of your day.